You're listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Today in Manufacturing podcast. With me this week are Jeff Branke and Anna Wells. We each have more than 15 years of experience covering the manufacturing industry. Every week, we take the five most popular stories in the manufacturing industry and discuss the implications they have on the industry going forward. Before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, David, or Anna at IN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. Anna, how are you doing this week? I'm doing great. Doing great? Now <laughs> yeah. that we have everything sorted in the studio oh, area? So many things to sort today, mm-hmm. but we it's got it sorted. Lar- the larger the space becomes for video production... Mm-hmm the more stuff we accumulate in weird areas. Yeah, I think we might have like a bit of a hoarder situation happening with the video team here. Mm -hmm, That's right. They can't hear me. The only thing the studio is missing is like stacks of newspapers. (laughs) 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 Jeff, do you have any uh, hoarded old food underneath you? Not seeing anything. Not seeing any mice screwing across the floor or Mm. anything like that. So I think we're still okay. All right. How are you doing this week? I'm good, man. All right. Well, just a reminder that we're live nearly every Friday at about 1.30 on YouTube. And before we get started with this week's top stories, we have a word from our sponsor. Oil Eater's household cleaners, industrial cleaners, and industrial equipment are specifically designed to replace dangerous solvents and are used throughout the world. Our safe water-based formula dissolves grease and grime for almost any surface and leaves a fresh, non-chemical scent. Our ultra-concentrated formulas are perfect for light, medium, or heavy cleaning and can be used on shop floors, in parts washers, to clean equipment, and more. VOC compliant, Oil Eater will do an excellent job in a multitude of applications, safely and cost-effectively, while reducing your chemical usage. Safe for the user, safe for the surfaces being cleaned, and safe for the environment. For more information, visit oileater.com or call 800-528-0334. All right, we're back. And now our first story, how to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. You may remember Brie Pettis. A few years ago, the co-founder of MakerBot was on the cover of Wired, Make, and Popular Science after his DIY 3D printer became an overnight sensation. Then, Stratasys bought MakerBot and Pettis moved on to other ventures. Now, Pettis is the CEO of Bantam Tools, and he's trying to create a new wave of desktop machines. Only, this time it's a CNC milling machine. His machine is part of an effort to get U.S. companies to bring prototyping and manufacturing back in-house. He also has some thoughts on how to close the skills gap and build an independent manufacturing workforce. Pettis remembers as a, <clears throat> at a young age when education focused on filling manufacturing jobs. But now, the U.S., as a community, has not done well finding ways to embrace manufacturing. He thinks part of the solution is telling the stories of people engaged in exciting developments in the industry. If an accurate picture can be painted, people will be inspired. So, Bree, come to our websites more often. That's kind of what we do on a daily basis. Pettis said, the culture needs to value manufacturing to narrow the skills gap. The current culture doesn't attract top talent to the many well-paying manufacturing jobs. Jeff, he also wants a culture of students and young people who have the urge to create. And I mean, if anyone knows about how it's hard to get young people to be inspired to do anything, you know, it's a man with three young daughters. (laughs) Three teenagers. Yeah, they're not always, they're inspired by their own ambitions, not necessarily mine, (laughs) which is sort of where I go with this. I mean, everything he says in here makes total sense. Mm -hmm. Can't argue with it. The unfortunate reality is we love running these articles, but we're sort of preaching to the choir, right? right Everybody yeah. in manufacturing knows all these things that he hit on, and he's completely accurate with all of it. I think what I would focus on a little bit is to make manufacturing work better here in the U.S. Yes, we've got a lot of opportunity right now based on the fact that the pandemic really made people rethink their supply chains and want to do more stuff closer to home. Mm-hmm. But even he admits that with Bantam, they still they still do some manufacturing overseas or they source from overseas. Right. They don't even do everything here in the U.S. So, And that's okay. Mm-hmm. It's a global economy and more so every single day. I think the biggest issue, and again, we've talked about this a ton here, with manufacturing in the U.S. is We've got all these job opens right now, jobs open right now, and we can't fill them. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think one of the biggest issues with that is, and you alluded to it and he did as well, and we've talked about it a ton, it is this societal perception or misperception of manufacturing. But I think one of the biggest issues is 
like the parents. I don't think it's yeah. really the teachers anymore. And I could, I was thinking about pulling up a bunch of stats showing all this, how the perceptions have changed over time mm-hmm. with manufacturing. But I remember growing up, my dad was a tool and die maker. And when I decided to go to college and go the more the white collar as opposed to the blue collar route, he was relieved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was happy. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of that comes from the fact that parents always want their kids to do better, mm-hmm. more. And it's not settling. And I think that's the biggest misperception. You're not settling for a manufacturing job anymore. Mm-hmm. These are great jobs. And I think a lot of those misperceptions, especially from my dad's perspective, came from the fact that he worked for a company that probably underappreciated him. Right. The work environment was hard. Mm-hmm. It was a difficult place to go. And there wasn't a chance for a lot of upward movement. In his, in his situation, which is why he looked at his kids hopefully doing something different and in his mind better, mm-hmm. which you can always appreciate, especially as a parent. I mean, we're all there. Oh, yeah. So I think it's getting past, it's really that area. And when we look at who do we need to influence, who do we need to talk to, it's like the parent-teacher associations. It's like community mm-hmm. groups. It's youth coaches. It's <laughs> all of those types of folks that can really have a big impact on people and understanding that it's cool to dream or aspire to get into a manufacturing job. Yeah, they're, they're great roles. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's where the disconnect is right now. It goes a little bit beyond doing more prototyping. Yeah. You know? No, agreed. And it's uh, I think that manufacturers are doing a better job of bringing students in. Uh, yeah. They're doing a better job of putting a, a, a better face forward. And it just needs to be more of that. And but I mean to his point, I do think that you get more people in uh, design and engineering and manufacturing if you get them making things too. And Anna, kind of my takeaway from this article was mm-hmm. that this is what he did before with MakerBot. He made MakerBot a small desktop 3D printer that you could make for for yourself. You could uh, 3D print your own uh, your own things in your own home, and that made people excited. That's mm-hmm. why he was on the cover of Make Magazine. That's why he was such kind of a a cult figure for all these makers because that's what he was doing. And I think that's what he's trying to do with uh, Bantam tools as well. But, you know, it kind of isn't a desktop CNC milling machine doesn't have the same <clears throat> sex appeal as a desktop 3D printer. It it doesn't. And, you know, I agree with a lot of what both of you guys are saying, that there's still a big perception problem that's not solved. And you would think by now, because people are aware of it, Mm-hmm. that you would think that it was getting better. But if you look at the data behind it, it really is not getting better. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, <clears throat> you know, there are a few ways to approach that. Um, I think you need more figureheads that represent tradespeople that are, that have mainstream appeal, like mm-hmm. Repetis, um, yeah. like Mike Rowe. Like, I, yeah. you know, if we had like a couple dozen more Mike Rows, I mean, like there's lots of manufacturing influencers out there. And like to Jeff's point, they're not, I love them and I feel bad even saying this, but like they're not very well known outside the industry. So right. it does become sort of like an echo chamber where it's hard to move the needle in that way because people outside of that, you know, you're already, you're the low hanging fruit has already been yeah. grabbed. And I think in a way too, even like these programs where you're targeting um, high school students that are coming and bringing them into your facilities, like Sometimes that's the low hanging fruit as well, because those are the kids that already know that that's kind of their track. Right. Mm -hmm. You need to be like approaching this more comprehensively. But I do think one way to do that also is as manufacturing continues to kind of merge with tech, you're going to get more interest in what these companies are doing. I mean, if you look like at how the tech sector is sort of the cool place to be for kids coming out of college or high school, like everybody wants to work for Google. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I would say that like the Teslas of the world are kind of moving into that space. Yeah. Um, you know, SpaceX, Blue Origin, these manufacturers um, that are building things and doing exciting things. <clears throat> you know, people are intrigued by that. And those names are household names. So, I mean, even like GM and Ford, like they're showing themselves as being like innovators at this point in time where I think that you people would feel people want to feel proud about saying, like, I work for this company that's doing all this cool stuff. So some of that's marketing, Mm -hmm. some of that's the tech, um, but I think the more visibility, the better. And obviously that's a long game, but that's how changing perception works. Like that's what you got to do. No, um, I do agree with you, Jeff, that it should be at the parents level, but we have seen some good progress in terms of schools getting back into tech ed classes. Mm -hmm. Um, Something that was pretty much abandoned for the last 10 years. And it was just a travesty because without them, I would have never known that I could actually work with wood. But uh, so 
Um, and we've seen a lot of progress when it comes to tech ed in rural communities, uh, particularly with community colleges that have been doing really well. One thing that I would like to see another um, or kind of make a bigger comeback are um, I can't remember what the classes were called, but basically once you were a junior or senior, if you kind of knew that the trades or uh, manufacturing was going to be your track, you could work all like a full day and get high school credit and still graduate wow. with anybody else. I mean, that's how my dad got into the business was that, you know, by his second half of junior year, he was pretty much working full time because he was like, yeah, none of that other business is for me. This is the way I want to go. And I think when we got into some of the programs like No Child Left Behind or other test focused, um, you know, uh, programs. We kind of got away from that. Mm -hmm. You know, we kind of got away from not it, because it was sort of an identity problem, Jeff, right? Like, you know, I want better for my kid. I don't want it to be, I don't want my kid to work in some dirty facility, but it also made it sort of a, it, we kind of cut off that entry point where people were starting in high school. And I mean, uh, there are some interesting stories of people that, you know, when they start their junior year of high school, I mean, by the time they've already got like 14 years in by the time they're 30, you know, and they have incredible seniority, uh, 30, 40, what did I say out there? Anyway, math. Don't worry about math. Clearly why I didn't we do it. words here. Not yeah. necessary. No, but, uh, I think that's something that we're kind of missing and, mm -hmm. uh, we could do a little bit more to, uh, move the industry forward. So well, you're talking about like a child labor solution no, as being what we're missing? No, not okay. like what Foxconn does with interns. Okay. This was legitimate. You would get high school credits. Mm -hmm. Um, for going to work and it, and you would still get pulled, you would get paid, uh, mm -hmm. you'd get paid a fair wage as well. So it's not, uh, child labor, but, uh, <laughs> but it's also, I mean, it's also kind of a best case scenario for people that aren't on sort of a college track and people like, you know, even the tone that I use when I mm -hmm. say that makes it seem like it's negative, but it's not negative. No, it's They're, not at like, all. Uh, no. You're putting somebody ahead of the rest of the pack in mm -hmm. manufacturing by getting them in early to something that they could really thrive in, mm -hmm. you know, and enjoy and yeah. enjoy. Yeah. yeah. It's the same as people taking college classes in high school as an AP course. You mm -hmm. know, we're getting, uh, they're getting a jump start on college. They're just getting a jump start on the labor market. True. And I think another reason that our parents generation like wanted to move us away from it is I don't know about you guys, but I know like a lot of, um, that era of tradespeople like the ergonomics were not as good back then. The precautions were not as good. And a lot of them, you know, people are hitting like 50, 55, and they just cannot do those jobs anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's like a really hard place to be, you know? Oh, yeah. um, and then you're and aged out. You're aged out and it's unfair and, you know, you're not like being taken care of. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like now, if you look at some of the the headway that's been made in terms of like PPE equipment, stuff that's designed to make sure that like you can continue to be an electrician um, as long as you want without like crushing your body. Yeah. Without being like. Well, and I think, ahead. I think another thing too, that's changed is just the whole operational dynamic in addition to safety and clean these manufacturers just run better. Yeah. One mm -hmm. of the reasons my dad was always frightened about us maybe getting into manufacturing was because he could see five or 10 years down the road at any given time that plant could shut down. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. It just wasn't run as well. And he was right. By mm -hmm. the time he retired where he worked, well, that building, that facility was shut down and sold to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I think the fact that these are more stable operations, they're just run better from an enterprise level sure. is also encouraging. And the timing is right in terms of getting in this highly qualified next generation of workers. Yeah. And I think we also need to almost differentiate what, what type, type of job we're talking about. Because when you talk about like Teslas and SpaceX's, mm -hmm. I'm thinking like design engineering jobs. You know, one like you're not thinking of assemblers. You're not thinking of the assembly and QA people. But they uh, do have those people. True, yeah. true. And that's where it's got to be like people got to realize that it, you don't just have to be an engineer to work there. Right. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> well, I think we spent at least our five minutes on that story. So let's move on to the next one. Uh, rescues after China building collapse. The death toll has risen after a residential and commercial building collapsed in central China. As of this recording, 26 people have been confirmed dead, but a 10th survivor, an unidentified woman, was recently pulled out of the wreckage six days after the building suddenly caved in. Teams have been using dogs, hand tools, drones, and electronic life detectors in search for survivors. At least nine people have been arrested in connection with the collapse. The building is described as a, quote, self-built building. 
the, oh, the question mark's mine. And there is a suspicion of ignoring building codes or committing other violations. The arrested include the building owner, three people in charge of design and construction, and five others who allegedly gave a false safety assessment. An increase in the number of collapses of self-built buildings in recent years has prompted China's president to call for additional checks to uncover structural weaknesses. Anna, the more I read the story, you know, you throw in that caveat like, oh, this is a different place. This is China. But you can't. I just it sounded to me like they were building a tree fort with the lack of regulation and how uh, certain like simple things like floors that weren't on the plans are added. I can't believe things like this happen anywhere in the world. Yeah, it is hard to believe. Um, and it's another story, I think, that reinforces the need for regulation. You know, mm -hmm. like the building being described as self-built. I mean, I'll say this, anyone who's done a renovation or built any stru structure of any size in the United States, or at least in most states, has had a laundry list of forms, requirements, and it drives everybody nuts. Like, mm -hmm. you know, what you have to go through, the hoops and stuff to get this stuff built. But, you know, you're submitting erosion plans and like, you know, all these visuals, like to make sure that what you build in the end is not going to collapse. Mm -hmm. um, there's a reason behind it. And as you mentioned, like China has arrested some people, nine people, um, and the president has said, quote, it's necessary to check such structures for any hidden dangers and fix them to prevent major accidents. Yeah. Uh, but when people are making these structural modifications and then also pr false safety assessments, like something is wrong at the root of this. Like, mm -hmm. how is that even happening? I know here this is a this is a government role. It's not like something that you can just like submit a form that you doctored that says like this yeah. building is safe to be in. Yeah. Um, Which plenty of people still do. Yeah, it's just, I don't know. The, the fact is that China has like a long history of poor adherence to safety standards. Mm -hmm. And it's not uncommon, according to a report in The Guardian that I read, to see a legal addition of extra floors and failure to use reinforcing iron bars. Yeah. yeah. That, so that means too. like if, if that's like a matter of course there, then you have a, a bigger problem than just this one off. This is not a one off. This mm -hmm. is a, a, a bigger problem than that. No, I actually, I pulled those exact two quotes out as well, Anna, because, and that's what led me to think, this sounds like how kids make a bad tree fort, Jeff. We're just like, no, 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 I think, I think we should have, you know what, it'll be fine. It'll Here's be fine. the difference though. When you go into a tree fort, you know what it was built by and by whom, and you, mm -hmm. you have an understanding there. Folks getting into this building did not. Yeah. There, there was no, under, there oh, was no yeah. appreciation of that. And the fact that we don't even know the exact size of this building sort of underscores a lot of the issues that are going on here. Mm -hmm. Looking again, I think maybe been the same article, but looking, India is the only country in the world that has more building collapses than China on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy, especially when you look at a country that has the infrastructure potentially and the just standard of living that mm -hmm. China has. These types of things should not become an issue, but they do because mm -hmm. of a corrupt system in terms of these regulators. Air, in air quotes, mm -hmm. um, checking this stuff out or not checking it out. And as a result, a lot of people's lives are put in danger. What, what it feels like in trying to do some research on this, and again, it's difficult because China doesn't let a whole lot of information out here to, mm -hmm. uh, to let you know what's going on, but it does reaffirm some of those stereotypes or classifications in terms of things in China. There's not a focus on quality. Mm -hmm. Okay, Whenever you look at products coming from China, they're lower cost, lower quality potentially. Well, if that emanates into some of these situations as well, it's not a surprise that they're having trouble with these buildings. If yeah. they're not focused on quality and the focus is on, hey, let's get this up there so we have more space to either rent out, bring people into the restaurant, whatever the case is, obviously these things are going to happen when quality and safety aren't a priority. And that just seems to permeate throughout a lot of these stories and a lot of potentially the culture that we're seeing in China as it's trying to grow and expand. Yeah. The one thing, too, that did come up, sorry to cut no, you off, no, but no. I mentioned infrastructure. That is another concern in China. Mm -hmm. A lot of it oh, is yeah. really old. And again, when we don't have regulators doing their job and they can be bribed to basically just write it off and go forward, I mean, this could be a huge, a continuing to be a huge issue, especially if China wants to develop that upper middle class. Yeah. I, uh, 
I understand if you have the bedroom in the basement that's not a bedroom because it's, you know, legally it doesn't have egress, whatever. But when they're talking about not knowing how many floors right. the building had, right. mm -hmm. that is beyond me. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I understand there's lazy regulators, but no one just stood outside and counted windows. No, and it only becomes a chronic problem when you know you're not going to get caught. Right. Yeah. Oh, anyway. Very frustrating situation. Let's move on to our next most popular story this week. New airport, a quote, starting gun for future of transportation. On April 25th, 2022, Urban Airport and Supernull unveiled the Air One in the United Kingdom. The Air One is a proprietary deployable operations hub that could provide quick multimodal infrastructure for EV tolls and other passenger travel. It's like a small turnkey airport, but they call it a vertiport. The Air One is a 17,000 square foot circular structure built in just 11 weeks and designed to serve four key markets passenger air taxis, autonomous delivery drones, disaster emergency management and defense operations, and logistics. The middle of the vertiport has a 56 foot circular final approach and takeoff platform that rises 19 feet into the sky using a small link lift system for takeoffs and landings. Supernal is a part of Hyundai Motor Group, and it's developing an EV toll vehicle prototype called the SA1, which is actually in display at the vehicle hangar. The Air One is located about two blocks from the city's main rail and bus stations to show how these prefab structures can advance multimodal travel. Now, Anna, what I liked about this story was we were talking about a brand new airport that things couldn't fly in and out of. So it struck me at first, but then I realized this is more of a demonstrator or a prototype than an actual, uh, let's say, ready for prime time concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a prototype airport. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Because that's what we need. As, yep. Right. As you know, I tend not to appreciate developments in areas that uh, are so aspirational that, um, I don't know, there's so many more other more pressing issues to deal with, I feel like, than this. I mean, we can't even use this airport. I get like they're trying to maybe get at the the demo part of it or yeah. maybe even get at the infrastructure part of it. But like that's really not the way it typically works that you build the infrastructure first and then convince people to get an airplane to go to work. I don't know. Well, it's, I, I think it's cool because it's like deployable infrastructure. I don't think it's as cool as you think it is. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. I just think it, it look, puts a lot of pressure on the timeline for some of these things to proceed. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they're basically like sitting on a cost center. That's like, I don't know like what the payback is going to be in the near term logistics. Yes. I see like that within a handful of years. Targeting commuter traffic or passenger taxis, like that sort of hinges on like some pretty broad assumptions that it's going to be more convenient to fly to the place that you don't, aren't actually trying to get to. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's right. I mean, like there's a lot of um, like buzz that for a long time, there's a lot of buzz around car sharing mm -hmm. and people in the end, I think, didn't really weren't really attracted to the idea of it because you don't always know when you're going to have your car. car yeah, like, so like, yeah. I think it's the same to me. It's like the same kind of thing. It's like, well, I, like I need to get here. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I need some a way to get to this airport to fly to this other airport to get to a bus station to get to my job or something like that. Yeah. I just don't know that people are quite ready for that. Um, that's going to take some doing. Yeah. Uh, and I know that it's like, this is for trying to like play that out, see how it works. Maybe they'll get some more perspective on consumer preferences. But it seems a bit ambitious to me, not knowing if any of that stuff's going to work. It could make more sense if you think of it more as a helipad, you know, because then it kind of your typical business traveler <laughs> is going to be, you know, it's it's only going to oh. be high end travelers. Like, oh, a helipad. Oh, yeah, ah. yeah. So, oh, so we're catering to the high end Wall Street guys. That's so what just, we're taking yeah, care. just well, helicopter travel. You got to work. take yep. care of them. Okay, All right. now I'm in. Ah, yeah, the yeah. other things are that it has its own uh, power supply that can charge EV vehicles, which would be important. And in the immediate uh, <laughs> like future where it could be used uh, is a uh, disaster relief. So the big part of this is that they can be made really in a really quick turnaround. This one was made in 11 weeks. But the whole idea is that say there was a disaster where we are. Yeah. You know, they could drop one of these over by the Alliant or someplace really close to the disaster area and then fly in supplies and support as a result. 
So that's where it could actually make a, a big play before it's people driving their EVs in parking so they could take their urban air taxi or walk to the bus. But again, again, so like say there's another like Katrina scale hurricane mm-hmm. and that area is decimated and it needs a lot of help. We're going to spend 11 weeks <laughs> building a freaking airport there first. We can j- like, no, that no. doesn't make any sense. No, like, this, well, I mean, this one took 11 weeks specifically, but the okay. whole idea okay, is that but, it doesn't take 11 weeks. Okay. So say it takes two weeks. Like, yeah, don't, don't they're going to do it in one day. Oh, all right. It's inflatable. Hey, they actually note to producers, it. Can it, I just get some popcorn the next time we have one of these types of uh, <laughs> stories here so I can just enjoy this back and forth? Can they do it in 15 minutes, David? Jeff, do you think they could do it in 15 minutes? <laughs> oh, man. You you had to know going in, this was not going to, you were going to be on an island with this one. Right? Oh, it's, I mean, uh, no, I wasn't going to be on an island. I was going to be in a boutique airport. <laughs> so I've moved past the fact that I was called a curmudgeon mm-hmm. on this. I've just totally gotten past that when you called me that on this podcast. <laughs> and I don't let it stick with me that my daughters continually remind me how old I am. Okay. I've gotten past all of that. Good. So good. I read this and watched the video like three times. <laughs> To try to get on board, yeah. to not like, be that guy. What am I mm-hmm. missing? And I don't see it. <laughs> I, I don't get it. I don't understand why we need this. I don't. Um, I don't see how it's a priority. We still haven't gotten like EV vehicles figured out, and now we're mm-hmm. going to build something for EV flying machines that at best hold five people. Mm-hmm. I don't best. see how that's that's better. Yeah, I don't get it's it. It's all about the future of multimodal transportation, Jeff. Let's figure out the basics first before we start going here, man. I mean, there's just better ways to spend our time and energy. And nice try with the disaster recovery. No, I mean, well, that was digging deep. No, I legitimately could, like, if there was, that's the, one of the biggest issues is You know when David's flustered because he stops and starts more than twice. One of the biggest <laughs> issues with disaster relief is reaching the area. And, I mean, if this could create an opportunity for that i don't know i uh i agree with you <laughs> i'm david's advocating the heck out of this thing just yep. trying to get it to work like no you guys will see the light of the urban air yep. ports um no i agree with you this is <laughs> it's uh more on the futurism side of things that we do it's not something that we need right now but we also we keep seeing how the landscape of transportation might change and they're trying to figure out a what that might look like going mm-hmm. forward. No, I'm glad that you are like the, I mean, you're more of the like visionary, I would say of our group. And I'm definitely more the like, it's not practical, <laughs> but right? it's I'm not. Just a curmudgeon. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm like and the, the curmudgeon. Yeah. yeah. In, like as a uh, metaphor, I'm like the lit cigarette that you guys keep putting out. Just <laughs> stamp it out. <laughs> just like, don't see it. Uh, oh, and actually the producers are so on it that they brought you some popcorn Jeff. for the next time. Oh, so yeah. hopefully Excellent. if we, uh, let's see what the next story is. Yeah, let's see what we can get we going. We can really get fired Thank up. Thank you, Alex. Um, anyway, when they open one of these, it's in the UK now, but one's coming to Miami and I'm sure one will be in Chicago. I'm going to go see it. Right now yeah. it's just a tourist trap though. All right. All right. Our second most popular story this week, 1,000 UAW members strike in Wisconsin and Iowa. More than 1,000 workers at a pair of CNH industrial plants went on strike on Monday. The company makes agriculture and construction equipment. According to the United Auto, U- <clears throat> According to the United Auto Workers Union, employees in Racine, Wisconsin and Burlington, Iowa, went on strike after contract talks faltered. The work stoppage is just the latest in a series of strikes, including the month-long strike at Deer & Company. Deer workers got 10% raises and improved benefits for 10,000 UAW workers at that equipment maker. Anna, every time we have a story about a new strike, Mm -hmm. we say strike while the iron is hot. Seems like it's hot for CNH. Yeah. Um, Yeah, exactly. We've talked a lot about this shift in leverage uh, with employments or sorry, unemployment still at record lows. Mm -hmm. Um, Now is the time for labor to act if they're going to. I mean, they haven't had this much power in decades. And there are precedents being set daily with um, these types of scenarios that are working out in workers' favors. Mm -hmm. Um, And while there are countless examples of that, I think Deere, of course, stands out considering that these two companies are in the same industry. Mm -hmm. Um, Deere strike felt like forever, I think because it was so widely covered and maybe um, in the face of like tremendous demand, a month was forever. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was a lot of outside pressures, I think, um, that applied to that strike. It's not like with consumer auto where people just don't get their new cars and everyone's like, well, mm-hmm. <laughs> in this case, like, um, you know, this could impact like a harmer, uh, farmer's like harvest. Um, it could 
impact food supplies potentially. Oh, yeah. um, that's the kind of stuff they were saying about the deer strike. Um, and with supply chain conditions like the way that they are now, I think that it's just an added layer of pressure on these companies to negotiate. And um, we'll see if they also deal with some of the public sentiment that came the way of the John Deere strike because John Deere is such a household name. And I doubt that Case New Holland has the same kind of broad reaching brand awareness as Deere. Certainly not the same feel as the deer strike where mainstream media was covering that day and night. Mm -hmm. um, this is a little bit more, um, you know, under the radar, I think. So you don't have like politicians nationally really weighing in on this. You don't have a lot of like social media stuff happening. So I don't know if they'll be feel as pressured to negotiate the way deer did. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I hope I, I, precedent has certainly been set that they have maybe earned a a seat at the table here to try to figure something out. No, I agree. And Jeff, I think part of the deer work stoppage was that deer started getting some intense pressure from suppliers and uh, manufacturing partners. And that's going to be the same case for CNH as well. Absolutely. Case New Holland is just as big a brand name within that market. I think they won't get the same pressure from investors in the financial market that Deer did as well as because of the, the media coverage. But within that market, from a consumer basis, they are going to feel this mm -hmm. because they operate at a little bit different price point than John Deere. So the impact that it could actually have on the end user market is potentially even greater mm -hmm. if these guys cannot get what they need in terms of their implements and their tractors and things of that nature. So I think there is a potential to be a huge deal. The other thing, we brought this up with John Deere as well, and this is the John Deere strike. That was a that was more than a thousand workers. It was a much it was larger, ten thousand. Yeah, I think yeah. it was much larger. So I think that's another part of it where maybe the scale is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But what's the same is we're looking. I'm quoting a, an article here from the Des Moines Register. Um, Case New Holland celebrated a year last year where they reported um, a $1.76 billion profit in 2021. That was a 21% improvement over Oof. 2019. Mm -hmm. Their CEO brought home almost well, just over $12 million in bonuses. Mm. So when you see those types of numbers and yeah. then you look at what these folks are getting paid, again, referencing this article as well as Indeed, those guys are still starting, or the average, I should say, pay is under 25 bucks an hour for a lot of their plant floor workers. That's not competitive anymore. Mm -hmm. You need to step up. These folks are seeing what's going on in other plants like John Deere and others in the area as well. And they're seeing not only an opportunity, but also what they're owed. Again, these were frontline. These were folks that stayed on board and were working long long hours when everybody else was on lockdown. Mm -hmm. So they put themselves out there and now they're just looking for a little bit of payback. Yeah. And the company sure seems like it has the coffers that they can open up to help them out. It's always hard to sympathize when you see record profits, but uh, <clears throat> they always like to compliment the workers too for their hard work. <laughs> Your in favorite the face, thing. Yeah, yeah. In the face of uh, uh, such a struggle. Now, the one thing I saw was that this strike is the first at the uh, at the plants in nearly two decades and comes after a previous, uh, I think it was a six-year contract between CNH and the United Auto Workers expired on April 30th. So, um, you know, maybe they didn't see this coming because it's been so long. But I mean, I feel like companies need to have a better pulse on where the workers stand in terms of, uh, you know, being happy. Yeah. It's, I mean... Do you think companies see this coming? Well, it. I mean, I didn't realize that their contract just expired on April 30th. Sometimes there's some wiggle room there where they're working without a contract and trying to negotiate. These guys did not waste a minute. No, it's just like, yeah, let's get at it. So clearly there was some built up mm -hmm. momentum there where they were concerned about the way things were going. Mm -hmm. uh, Case has an incredible legacy that dates back to like 1842 in Racine. Yeah. You know, Racine has always been known as sort of that uh, agricultural uh, equipment manufacturing hub. And it's just, I don't know. Um, I know that it's not nearly the scale as John Deere. Like we've said, I think that CNH only has about 5,000 workers total, right? I don't know the total. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, the scale is not there, but it could still be quite disruptive. Oh, extremely. Is this is still Racine Case High School? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Hey, that's it's named after Case, huh? Hmm? It was named after oh, the yeah. brand. Named after Jerome Case. Uh, yeah, no, it was. Um, I have a former uncle that used to teach there, and so that's where when all of my friends went to camp in my town, I went to all the camps at Case, and they're like, "Who's this guy? <laughs> like, <laughs> ah, how's it going? I know the guy running it. No one's gonna like me. Thanks. <clears throat> I'm gonna get extra T-shirts though. What's up? <clears throat> all right. 
Our most popular story. Foxconn could soon own Lordstown. Last September, Lordstown Motors looked like it was on the brink of bankruptcy. But then Foxconn offered a lifeline. The global electronics contract manufacturing giant offered to buy Lordstown's Ohio factory for $230 million and purchase $5 million in stock. Then, the companies would figure out a deal for Foxconn to assemble Lordstown's flagship SUV and build out its own EVs using Lordstown's tech. As of March, the two companies were still struggling to come to terms on certain conditions. Now, Lordstown has confirmed the conditions to close still have not been met. Foxconn has already paid the $200 million in down payments required by the agreement. And if the two parties can't realize closing terms by May 14th, Lordstown is obligated to repay. And if Lordstown can't repay, I know this was your story, but Foxconn is going to take everything. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm trying to figure out if this was Foxconn's master plan, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Which sounds nefarious, but we've seen their track record. And I feel like a bait and switch is certainly on the table, potentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not out of the realm. <laughs> yeah. Um, unfortunately for Lordstown, you talk about leverage. Like their only option here is probably bankruptcy mm-hmm. outside of this. So they're probably doing their best here to negotiate, I think. But they don't have a lot of good options otherwise. So... That's the hand that they have been dealt. Mm -hmm. Um, But for Foxconn, if this deal doesn't get made, there's actually like, they're not actually out that much, like $50 million in terribly worthless stock, which doesn't potentially, it's not worthless forever, maybe even. Um, And if they can simply take all of Lordstown's assets and then they have some more flexibility with how they're going to move forward and they avoid a tie up with this very badly damaged brand. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, maybe they're not negotiating in good faith as expressed in this press release. Um, I don't think that Lordstown benefits from making it sound like they're not Mm -hmm. uh, because they still got to work this out. Um, But we know from past experience that you can't exactly trust them at their word. So there's a lot we don't know about the situation, but my point overall is that Foxconn is in a very good position here and Lordstown is not. No, (sighs) I mean, I don't know if Lordstown is going to be able to, you know, understand that it's in a bad position. I mean, it's not like they have any experience (laughs) being in a bad position, (laughs) being in a bad position (laughs) pretty much since their founding. Uh, And I actually, based on Foxconn's history, I kind of think the opposite, where the more I have learned about Foxconn and how they operate, they play it real fast and loose, where it's like, I don't know, yeah, maybe we'll buy that factory. You know what? Maybe we won't. You know what? Maybe we'll buy the factory and we'll make cars there. You know what? Maybe we won't. So I think this was just another potential uh, move that Foxconn saw um, and kind of just let it ride. You know, I don't think they were. This is all coming out of their marketing budget is what you're saying. I mean, not their marketing budget, but I mean, 200 million, 250 million dollars for Foxconn is nothing. And I mean, oh, I know. Yeah. And it's just like I I was actually the most surprising part of this entire story was when you said Foxconn already paid the two million in down payments. I was like 200 million or 200 million. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, they sent a check. That is shocking. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jeff, if Foxconn does take all of Lordstown, when they take all of Lordstown's assets, what then? Yeah, this reminds me of either like when I'm playing Monopoly with the girls and they just kind of gang up on me and just start taking all my stuff. I can't pay rent anymore, so they start taking properties and hotels. Your kids do that? They just throw you right out on the street? Oh, they're brutal. Mm -hmm. My youngest daughter, she is vicious when it comes to Monopoly. <laughs> There's no no games there. She just starts flicking the hotels. and oh, she, No, she's just super like, cold about it. She's like, well, if you can't pay, you can just give me Boardwalk. Oh, oh man. Mm-hmm. All right. What am I going to do? Boardwalk, Honey? though? Okay. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Or like those three, I don't know, those three uh, magenta colored uh, properties over oh, here. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. I don't even know. Was that St. Charles? <laughs> you know? Yeah, she's she's harsh. But she's set up well for the future. <laughs> Yeah, this She's could ready also for corporate America. Yeah, Lordstown is kind of like me taking my 1985 Pontiac Grand Am to the dealership and being like, "Hey, let's bargain. Let's deal. What can I do for a new vehicle here?" Mm-hmm. They have no bargaining power, and I think I think you agree with half of what you said about Foxconn. I think they got into this thing. 
hey, let's just see what we got here. Mm-hmm. Because they do have big aspirations for getting into the electric vehicle marketplace. They've got this mobility mobility and harmony. Um, harm, is it MIH or HMI? I can't remember here now. Let me look at my notes. Okay. Yeah, mobility and harmony consortium Mm -hmm. of automotive suppliers. It's like 1,700 automotive suppliers that have come together with Foxconn's goal being to sort of be the android of EV cars, where they've got this basic infrastructure that they can have together as a contract manufacturer to then basically make whatever car you want. You want to put a different body on it? We can handle that. Just Mm -hmm. get us the specs because we've already got all this infrastructure in place. Mm -hmm. So I think once they got in there and saw what an unholy mess Lordstown (laughs) is, they basically said, you know what? We put this ridiculous provision in here that Lordstown would never have signed on to unless they had no other choice. Mm -hmm. We can always execute that and move forward because they still got the facility that they wanted if they do indeed want to get into EVs, which it seems they really, really do. Right. If anything, it's bad news again for Mount Pleasant because there have been rumors about uh, Mount Pleasant, Wisconsin. There have been rumors about those facilities possibly being a hub for Foxconn to make electric vehicles, which, I mean, Foxconn has been talking about making electric vehicles forever. Right. I mean, there were rumors that Mm -hmm. they were going to build the Apple car. I mean, the Apple car still remains one of the greatest Rumors out there like, when are they going to drop it? Scam. Yeah. Never. They will never drop it. It's not a thing. But yet, so many industrial designers out there will come up with new Apple car concepts all the time, get millions of views because people are like, I think this is the one. There will be no one. There will be no one. Um, <clears throat> so let me get this straight. Going back to last week, you think there's going to be a Datsun before an Apple car? Definitely. EV Ooh. Datsun made on a Foxconn chassis. There you go. Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah. I saw this thing recently about, and I cannot remember which uh, electric car company it was, but they were like um, so worried about competing against Apple that they decided to make their own phone. Like what? <laughs> that I'll have to look it up, and I'll I'll bring some more information next week. But um, that's how crazy these rumors have gotten. Like, well, if we need to c- compete with the Apple car, which doesn't exist. Mm. We're going to make our own phone, t- phone too. And it's going to compete with the iPhone. What are you doing? Like, yeah, that's what the world needs. Another zoom. Just take a day off work and then <laughs> and take a long nap and then come back. Yeah. You've had too much coffee. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, I remain skeptical of anything Foxconn does. The only company I might trust less is Lordstown. Oh yeah. So it's quite a partnership. Yeah. Where it's just like together we will <laughs> we will create nothing. Mm-hmm. We'll create a lot of bluster. Yep, we're going to spend some money and that's it. Yeah. No, so uh it remains to be seen, but uh I think don't Lordstown hold your breath. holds some sort of record for the most coverage without actually producing a product. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I mean, you don't have to um produce a product to be publicly traded. That's adorable. <laughs> Lordstown Lordstown was the company that uh, did the trials with the truck by pushing it downhill, right? Yes, they did. (laughs) Yes, they did. Ah, that's what we need more of. All right. Well, before we move on to In Case You Missed It, we have another word from our sponsor. Oil Eaters household cleaners, industrial cleaners, and industrial equipment are specifically designed to replace dangerous solvents and are used throughout the world. Our safe water-based formula dissolves grease and grime for almost any surface and leaves a fresh, non-chemical scent. Our ultra-concentrated formulas are perfect for light, medium, or heavy cleaning and can be used on shop floors, in parts washers, to clean equipment, and more. VOC compliant, Oil Eater will do an excellent job in a multitude of applications, safely and cost-effectively, while reducing your chemical usage. Safe for the user, safe for the surfaces being cleaned, and safe for the environment. For more information, visit oileater.com or call 800-528-0334. And we're back with In Case You Missed It, stories that weren't as popular on the website, but still stand to make a big impact on the industry going forward. Anna, I'd like to start with you this week. What's your In Case You Missed It? Sure. So um, my In Case You Missed It this week, uh, the headline read, Food Plant Fires Fuel Conspiracy Theory. (laughs) So that's where, amazing. that's where we are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, first of all, let me make it clear how much I hate conspiracy theories. Mm-hmm. Even like oh. the funny ones, like we fake the moon landing, stuff like that. Like, cause they go against a core belief that I possess as an individual, which is that three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. Mm-hmm. I just don't believe that <laughs> these 
that this stuff can happen without like uh, us all finding out about it. Nice. Um, but anyway, apparently there is a growing conspiracy theory alleging that fires at various U.S. food processing plants and other facilities are part of a deliberate effort to undermine the food supply in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So the Associated Press contacted officials like in relation to 23 different events. Um, eight from 2021 and the rest from this year so far, many of which were already deemed accidental. Mm -hmm. The NFPA also weighed in saying that there haven't been more fires, just more people paying attention to them. Mm -hmm. So more conspiracy theorists. Does mm -hmm. that surprise you? Nope. Um, so anyway, we know in our work covering this industry just how common these types of incidents actually are. And to be honest, like if they were increasing in any way, in my opinion, it would almost surely be due to the greater presence of like a transient workforce and untrained individuals at food companies as they struggle to attract workers. We know that that that's a real thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want you all to know that industry experts want to express that there is no danger to the food supply. And um, these fires are, as far as we know, accidental, very, very likely accidental. And this is from like fire departments yeah. and fire marshals. So. Um, don't worry about that. Please don't pass that along. If that's yeah. something that you hear, you can kind of quelch that uh, rumor. But isn't it in their best interest to say that these are coincidental? <laughs> Wouldn't you say it's yeah. funny yeah. that all these things happen together at once and no one says anything? I just think, first of all, I want to know. Yeah. Conspiracy theories or time travel, what do you like least? Oh, God. That is a... <laughs> Sophie's choice if I've ever heard one. Um, I hate them equally. Can I say that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jeff, don't you think that these fires <laughs> at food processing facilities could potentially be behind the skyrocketing prices that you're feeling? Whoa. I know I'm feeling at I'm feeling at the grocery store. Isn't that interesting? I'll go a step further. Whoa, Jeff. They were okay. probably set by Vladimir Putin <gasps> to really drive them up due to, you know, the conflict in Ukraine. Dude. He's doing all of these things at once to get back at the U.S. and drive up food prices. What I heard was a relationship between chemtrails and fires at food processing facilities. Now, isn't it interesting that at food processing facilities that have had fires... They've seen chemtrails above. Is that not interesting? I don't think you, it's even debatable. I'm just saying. In Guys, terms of how uh, there valid was this is. There was even a tie-in um, that, so I don't know if you saw that like a plane crash near like a General Mills plant. Mm, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> like a month or two ago. That was yeah. part of this. That it yeah. was like other disruptions like this plane crash. Mm -hmm. it's, Isn't uh, it interesting <laughs> that it crashed right by a General Mills plant? Yeah. Now, hold on a second. <laughs> Planes don't crash all the time. Aerospace, they do though. Technologically advanced. Yeah. Prop but they, planes, but they, but they do crash but, every day. But I'm just saying, this plane crashes near a food processing facility mm -hmm. at the worst possible time. Um, I like that the food industry also responded by saying, "You're just paying attention now." Yeah, yeah exactly. Like no one, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no one noticed this stuff before. How often it actually happens? We do because we cover this. Yeah, um, I'm sure our listeners do because they are paying attention. But um, yeah, it's the like suddenly can, people yeah. care about the supply chain. It's never yeah. been something you know before when people ask like what you do for a living, and you're like, "Oh, I write about stuff." Yeah. Like the supply chain. <laughs> no. I was like, what's that? <laughs> Sounds boring. See you later. I mean, I joke about national irritants, but uh, I actually really liked your analysis on this about how it's probably a result of more of a transient labor group and just, you know, safety standards that have not either been adhered to or people really don't follow. I mean, we mm -hmm. hear about a lot of injuries at uh, not just food processing, but meat processing facilities. It's it's unfortunately more common than people think. For and sure. I think mm -hmm. people would be would serve a greater good if they looked into that and maybe tried fixing it and making it a little bit safer for the workforce, Jeff, than uh, you know, waxing on yeah. conspiracy theories. I mean, it's obviously ridiculous. Food plants are extremely dangerous. When mm -hmm. you look at things that you don't even think about being a concern, but like f f fires from like flour. In, mm -hmm. in baking goods, Ex yeah. extremely flammable, extremely dangerous if they're not handled correctly. And you're right. It's an underpaid 
undertrained workforce in a lot of situations with not a lot of experience. So yeah, these things are going to happen and they are more susceptible, especially because there's sort of a convergence in a lot of these plants. There's not a lot of small food production facilities anymore. Mm -hmm. They're getting bigger and bigger as there's more consolidation. So there's more opportunity for these things to happen. That was one of the first things that blew my mind when we got into this industry was uh, the revelation that dust explodes. Combustible dust. Yeah. Yeah. I was just like, what do you mean you have a big vacuum for dust? Like that's an issue? Yeah, it's so strange. And Jeff's right though. Like before people knew about combustible dust, like 50% of like flour mills would just explode. Yeah. I mean, it's just- Well, that one in Atlanta, I think that was about 20 years ago, almost exactly. Huge. One of the worst industrial disasters in US history. Mm -hmm. Yikes. Well. So anyway, please, (laughs) please don't fuel the conspiracy. Uh, There's not one. Yeah. But if you do, it's not your fault for thinking critically. Because you're just an outlier yep. and the society needs more. No, we don't. Talk to your no. friends on Twitter no. about it. No. Yeah. We don't need more of that. We need more inter- internet tribalism. Just find four like-minded people, create yeah. memes and send them out. Help America. Man, you want to really set off the curmudgeon in me? Let's keep going oh, on that man. topic. Let's get on to Jeff's in case you missed it. <laughs> Jeff. Before he gets mad. What's your... <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Is in case you missed it, is about like curmudgeons in America. No, uh, all sorts of them. <laughs> what is your, uh, in case you missed it this week, Jeff? So continue to following up on this story with this Rivian plant down in Georgia, outside of Atlanta. It's, it's actually getting very interesting from perspective. Before we talked about how there was sort of this rivalry between the two Republican candidates for governor down there. The current governor Kemp is saying, hey, this is great. We do have to put up a lot of money to get Rivian down here to build this facility, but it's 7,500 jobs. And Mm -hmm. it's in an area of our state that could really use it, not to mention all the potential infrastructure that could follow this EV maker coming down here. His his, um, rival, also running for governor, Purdue, the former senator down there, is saying, no, you're just basically catering to this Soros guy who's a big backer of his, or of Rivian, I should say. So there was this political fighting that sort of has an underlying Trump emphasis to it, with Purdue being a a former supporter of, or a current supporter of former President Trump. But now what's coming to the forefront is actually a lot of people in this area are very concerned about this facility. Mm -hmm. It's a huge facility, again, 7,500 jobs, and they're worried about it being in this rural setting, kind of destroying their lifestyle right now. Mm -hmm. They're worried about environmental factors. They're worried about the increased traffic, the pollution, and just what it's going to do to their environment. So what you've got is people in this area voicing what I feel are very legitimate concerns. And it's a growing number now. It's not like when it initially came up and we were looking at like, you know, 200 people standing out in the middle of nowhere, not really being too vocal to where there is sort of a groundswell of questions being asked. The state has just authorized $1.5 billion out of the $5 billion cost for Rivian to build this facility. It's the largest in Georgia state history. And it continues to be a debate. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like, is is the state correct in coming in saying, look, we know what this is going to do for us long term. Mm -hmm. I understand some of the pain points, but this is a good deal for us. We have to do this versus the people saying no thanks. Mm -hmm. Who's right here? Because you feel like the political powers do have the people's best interest in mind in terms of looking forward. But if they don't want it, how much do you force it down their throat? And if it would come to it, where does Rivian go? We just ran and we were talking about this the last couple of weeks. We've got Oklahoma and Kansas throwing out Tons of money to mm-hmm. who we mm-hmm. think is Panasonic to get in on this EV sector. Mm-hmm. Maybe Rivian's got a lot of options where if they get in too much turmoil or if there's just too much conversation here blocking them in, in uh, Georgia, they can go someplace else. So I think this is going to be interesting to see how this continues to evolve because it's not just about one facility. It's about a whole market segment. Mm-hmm. Again, Rivian's got Amazon behind it. It's got a lot of support. It's even got pre-orders for trucks and stuff that uh, they're looking to roll out in the next couple of years. So I think this this development could really set an interesting stage for EVs throughout the country. Where is the plant? Do you know precisely where the plant is supposed to go? It's about 45 miles outside of Atlanta, I believe okay. to the north of Atlanta. So it is a fairly rural setting, but it's sort of in the suburbs. Oh, okay. And again, these folks are saying, they're not necessarily saying absolutely not. They're saying, I need to see some data before yeah. we just go and go ahead and build it. No, I mean... Uh, as we've seen in these sort of cases in the past, more of that is is better. You know, yeah. don't be skeptical, ask questions, uh, and make sure that this is something that your city wants and needs. Well, I think the governor there is basically saying, if we pause too much, they're gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like they have other options. Again, those two states were 
begging somebody to come there without even telling everybody who it was they were trying to lure to their area. So yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting. Anna, uh, your thoughts on the negotiations and everything happening in Georgia. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, maybe people are becoming wise to the trade-offs potentially that come along with some of these bigger projects and that they are taking a bit of a risk. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's not just a matter of like, these are jobs we'll take them, whatever the cost. Um, people are looking at some of the other potential downsides. Um, Georgia incidentally was also the place where the spaceport situation yeah. took place where, oh, yeah. um, a community was trying to create economic development by building this like sort of public, um, space launch pad. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, and the, the voters in the area like vehemently voted down this project. And then the people that were trying to build it were like, trying to go through the court system to like still push it through, even though the local community didn't want it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's still ongoing. That's like, still yeah. ongoing. Still trying yep. to push that through. Yeah. It was just a futuristic spaceport. It was Did, not a vert port, David. Yeah. It was not a vertiport. Uh, you don't get to vote. A David. boutique vertiport. <laughs> um, Oh, <laughs> you're the vocal minority. Yeah. <laughs> For the vertiport, I will, but it's not, they don't have a lot of rope. Um, no, uh, anyway. Yeah, my point being that people seem to be looking at this in maybe a more nuanced way than they once did. Yeah. And so it does raise some questions as to how this might actually turn out. No, so uh, that was my thought, was that uh, if, when taxpayers always say, bring it in, you know, it's worth it. Taxpayers need to remember that when it goes bad, everybody else bails and you're the one on the hook. Mm-hmm. So, but what's interesting here is how much of a groundswell would there have been if it wasn't this other gubernatorial oh, candidate yeah, yeah. sort of bringing this to the forefront? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting how those political inroads kind of intersect and yeah. what yeah. kind of impact it could have. All right. My In Case You Missed It this week actually came out the day we were shooting this live and has just, it would have been in the top five had we put this together sooner. So, so it's kind of like- you stole it from next week's podcast? Uh, what you're saying? no, no, I'm just shining a light, a brighter light on a trash mountain. <laughs> Let's but, talk about the trash mountain. All right. The story that we ran by, uh, Ben Munson, the editor of design and development today is trash mountain could burst into flames any minute. I wish we had like an echo effect. Okay. At least live. Do we have that? No, it's okay. re like, They're gonna uh, do that in post. we'll know that we're a legit podcast when each of us has like five to 40 buttons with sound effects that we can play and just like any minute. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Sorry. Uh, they did not like the legit podcast. We'll be a more legit podcast mm -hmm. when we have more toys. We're making lots of friends today. And that's universal. Open anyway, up, open up that popcorn. About the trash mountain. Okay. Yeah. So public works officials in Everett, Washington have a problem. A 45-foot-tall steaming pile of smelly trash problem. Is it really steaming? Yes, it is. We'll get to that. The trash mountain is in one of the city's transfer stations and is now five feet from reaching the ceiling. Anna, things are so bad at this trash mountain that they have employees just sitting, watching trash mountain 24 hours a day because it could burst into flames at any moment. Now, the problem comes from microorganisms eating the refuse and generating heat within this festering junk heap. So it really is. It's steaming. Steaming yeah. and festering. Mm. It all comes down to the worker shortage and a strange supply chain. They don't have enough people to move the trash or anywhere to put it. So the county relies on trains with empty shipping containers to move the garbage from the rail yard to a nearby landfill. Supply chain disruptions have limited the amount of shipping containers that can be transferred over to the rail yard. Now, Trash Mountain could snowball or maybe trash ball into a $2 million problem because the county might soon have to start using waste management containers to transport the garbage, which is going to eat into the county's emergency funds. Now, I just think that once your Trash Mountain gets 20 to 30 feet tall, you start looking, mm -hmm. you start looking for solutions. You know, you're bringing more people in from the street with shovels. I don't know. Get a hose, but, start spraying that thing down. Yeah. It's, I don't know how you get it five feet from the ceiling. And it's just like, you know what? We better get on this. 
It's uh so depending on where you live, unless it's in Everett, I guess to Ben's point in the story was be happy you don't live by a festering trash mountain, but also maybe get ahead of it so that way this doesn't happen and oh you might God. burst into flames in the middle of your town. What's that? Just the trash fire? I mean, that's a joke, but... Is this like Springfield on The Simpsons? They have the, the burning, the tire factory burning, that's, or the tire fire that just is, never goes out? We actually had, uh, which it was uh, T, T. Marcone who said, Remember the fire at the tire yard in Springfield <laughs> that has been smoldering for decades. Yeah. And I stood at my desk and applauded. Well done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just, uh, you know, we don't get to we don't get to cover the trash heap uh, beat that much. <laughs> yeah, you don't <laughs> normally get that beat. It was Man. when he was talking about the story. I didn't believe it was real. Well, he kind of undersold. He's like, uh, I don't know. There's this uh, there's this thing going on. I guess it's like a trash mound that might catch on fire any minute. Yeah, and we're yeah, like, that's a good one. Yeah, we do should that go with story that. for we sure. Go with that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I feel like if you live streamed um, Trash Mountain twenty four hours a day, like uh, oh, that, man. people would pay like four ninety nine a month to just. Yeah, I mean, you could raise that two million live streaming not just the Trash Mountain, but also the worker has to sit and like maybe even once in a while hit a button that says. Still not on fire. Yeah, like extra steamy. They, get, they give that guy a mask or something. I mean, oh, good. This is oh, and like, what is he gonna do? <laughs> Just like <laughs> all of a sudden, yeah. Trash Mountain spontaneously combusts. It's not like he's gonna stamp out forty-five feet of fire. Just like, I better let someone know. Ugh. Like, it's uh, you raise a good point, Anna. Just live streaming. All right. Well, let's move on to our final thoughts this week, Anna. Before we get out of here, what's your final thought? Um, I just want to say a thank you to Doug, um, our loyal. Oh, faithful listener Doug. Or faithful listener Doug. I yeah. get that wrong every time. Um, I mean, he's loyal too. It's because of Doug that I remembered to actually cancel Netflix, <laughs> which I asked for your help last week and Doug, can't, he delivered. So anyway, I forgot though that I didn't need to actually binge Netflix last weekend because I still have it for like three more weeks. So it was very like, <laughs> like I was like and cancel and like it was like not very exciting because they're like okay we'll, we'll stop giving it to you in three weeks because you already paid ahead yeah your last date will be may 24th <laughs> yeah so you have three weeks to get on it so there was really no drama to that but um it felt good inside so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thanks doug no that was uh that happened to me i had i used to have a subscription to ufc fight pass mm -hmm. and one day i got so fed up i wanted to cancel it and i went to cancel it and then uh, somebody else was using my login and I was like, how are you still doing that? I didn't realize I, I was buying it on a yearly basis. <laughs> so like, I was like, just eight more months of it. And then, and then yeah. you're really going to stick it to him at that point. Yeah. Never again. Fight pass. <laughs> eight months later. She gone. Uh, my final thought this week, uh, just quick and simple. Wanted to wish a happy birthday to Chuck Marin, our uh, coworker, the marinator. Um, he turned a youthful age, I'm sure. Uh, you know, he gets older, but that mustache gets younger. I thought for sure you're going to say the number. Good. No, well no, 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 well no, no. I know that he's, uh, you know, celebrating the occasion with it being Cinco de Mayo. So I'm not sure if he's watching this live. Ah, uh, well, mm -hmm. anyway, happy birthday, Chuck. That's yeah, right. Happy birthday, Chuck. All right, Jeff, your final thought this week. So before I get to trivia, I actually had kind of an interesting like convergence of Revelations, I guess you could maybe call uh -oh, it. Oh, here yeah. comes Hopefully, some curmudgeon stuff. No, <laughs> you no, had a revelation. What is no. it? <laughs> Hopefully I'm the only person to see this. Hopefully oh. I'm the only unenlightened one, but I thought it was kind of interesting because as you guys know, for like the last three weeks, my daughters have been very heavily involved in the production of their musical in mm -hmm. high school. Mm -hmm. And they're both involved in the crew. Um, and I always appreciated the extracurricular activity and what it exposed them to and what it allowed them to do. But when I was in high school, we didn't, you know, going to a smaller school, we didn't have a ton of options. Yeah. Thankfully, the options we did have were sports. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I played basketball and football and all of those things that you want anybody at that age to sort of develop in terms of leadership and problem solving and hard work. I think it's very easy to see that mm -hmm. in something like sports mm -hmm. yeah. and maybe not as much in something like crew. I always appreciated it, but until really seeing them 
get into it as much as they were, not coming home to like 930 at night, Man. the yeah. scope of work that they had to do, the different situations they had to navigate and dealing with people and developing those team building skills and putting out fires and all that stuff just gave me a great appreciation for that. Mm -hmm. And it sort of piggybacked, again, my own experience in the military. I was trained in two different combat arms. So it's very easy to talk about leadership. And again, all of these other attributes when you're a platoon leader in an infantry arm, in an infantry unit, mm -hmm. as opposed to something else. But I'm reading this amazing book. It's called Secret Soldiers by Philip Gerard. And it talks about this collection of artists and actors and sculptors and painters who were part of this secret operations unit during World War II that were basically out to fool the German army. Mm. They would set up different... Um, Get sort of like false musterings of equipment and people. They developed different camouflage techniques. Wow. They developed different sonic technology to make it sound like tanks were in one area when really they were someplace else oh. to throw off the German army. And these guys couldn't, it was so top secret, they couldn't talk about this for like 60 years after the war ended. Cool. So to hear about all the things that were involved, and there were, there were people that went on to become mili um, people in Hollywood, different actors. Douglas Fairbanks, if you know that name, was actually one of the uh, lieutenant commanders of this unit. Mm -hmm. So just to see all of this, again, what these individuals who have backgrounds that you would not necessarily relate to all of those other attributes that we talk about in terms of leadership problem solving, mm -hmm. um, dealing with difficult situations, goal setting, all of that, it's there in spades. Mm -hmm. And where it comes into what we do, when we talk about difficulties hiring people, building teams, look beyond maybe what I always perceive are those traditional backgrounds for mm -hmm. having those skills. Somebody who's been involved in stage management could be a really good production, op production mm -hmm. manager. Mm -hmm. Somebody yep. who's been involved in lighting and sound understands quality control. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, it's not just drawing from some of those traditional things you see on a resume, but going a little bit deeper and understanding how some of these different backgrounds can have incredible impacts on your organization and in building these amazing teams. So it's just, again, hopefully I'm the only one who didn't get that, yeah. but it just, I always appreciated what was there, but the depth of it has just been enhanced by, by these two experiences for me. I don't think you're the only one that didn't get that. I think a lot of, there's a lot of underappreciation for the arts and theater in particular um, in the high school and even younger level. And actually moving beyond that, like uh, it doesn't end at the high school level. You know, you can do community theater and still yeah. earn, like uh, foster the same environment, grow the same attributes. Actually, that's one of the things that I look for on resumes is to see if they had any... Um, Anything to do, obviously, you look for sports, for the leadership, but I also would always look for theater. Yeah. It was just, a, you know, um, you get all these different intangible traits that uh, wind up translating to successful careers. Yeah, there's always an appreciation for it, but definitely taken to a different level and seeing with my kids and then reading about this, this army unit. So. I think that what we've arrived to is that Jeff should do some community theater. I think so. <laughs> I think so. I Hello, um, Dolly. write a check really well uh, yeah. when it comes to anything involved with the arts. Yeah. I think we go to the Bartell and uh, you yep. play Willie Loman. I think yeah. it'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> Willie Loman. <laughs> uh, yes. I thought that you, when you started out basically with a like kids of today um, lead in, I thought that you were going to get 100% curmudgeon, but you went the other way. Yeah. So I'm proud Full of you. Full of surprises. Yeah. You didn't. Mm -hmm. Think like Nazi rebel task force lead in. Kids today, today's youth mm -hmm. don't understand the value of a dollar by Jeff Ranke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, treaties, that's all true, but, but I didn't just didn't go there right now. <laughs> it's true for all the other ones that don't do anything. Uh, Jeff, do we have uh, trivia again this we week? We do. So first of all, just offering the answer to last week, and we had a couple of people that we had a lot of people respond. We actually only had two people get it right, though. And the the question was about if there is an electrical, somebody suffers from an electrical burn, oh. what should you not touch either the source or the individual with? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The answer is your bare hands. Ah. You do not want, because obviously they, you can conduct the electricity. You want to make sure, wrap something around them, whatever, pull them across, make sure they are not in contact with that source of the electricity anymore before you try to help them out. I so said, bare hands. yeah, I said water and I stand by it because you probably shouldn't touch them with water either. There's probably lots of stuff you shouldn't touch them with. Yeah, yeah. But that's the one, mm -hmm. the first one. Mm -hmm. So Mark and Mark, we had two Marks chime in, get that one right. We were up mm -hmm. to somebody who's got three in a row. Oh, whoa. so Way to go, getting Marks. into Marina territory here, who still holds the record with six. Whoa. We haven't heard from in a little bit, so hopefully she's uh, still doing great and listening to the podcast. <laughs> But this week's trivia. Now, this was inspired a little bit by looking at some of those pictures 
when we were um, covering that story about those individuals being taken out of that building that collapsed oh. in China. And you saw a lot of um, first responders doing some pretty <clears throat> heroic stuff there. And it got me thinking about my combat lifesaver training that I had to go through in the Army. We had to know all these different carries that you could use depending on the size of the individual, the scope of their injury, what you had available to you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to list off five types of carries. One of them is false. Oh, okay. A false carry? Which one is not an Army approved carry? We've got the saddleback carry. We've got the four person stretcher carry, the pistol belt carry, the neck drag, and the two man <laughs> arms carry. These are all made up. Which one is not correct? Oh, I want it to be neck drag just because that just seems like a brutal carry. <laughs> The neck drag. Yeah. So again, it depends on your environment, all that, but one of those is definitely false. So mm -hmm. let's see what we can get. Luckily, I married the true carry, not the false carry. <laughs> oh, well done. no. Well done. Mm -hmm. you can't mm -hmm. hang it on Hi, carry. Well done. All well right. Done. She might hear that. She would appreciate it. Too. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <clears throat> all right. Well, before we get out of here this week, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, David, or Anna at IN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You could also subscribe to our daily or weekly newsletters. And make sure you get the podcast in your inbox first. All right. For Jeff Ranke and Anna Wells, I'm David Manti. This is the Today in Manufacturing podcast. We'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast.